Having fled for their lives from the battle between army and guerrilla fighters, the people here are squeezed together under primitive circumstances, cooking food on open fires. In the last few months, 1,500 innocent civilians are said to have been killed in the area. Here at the missionary station in Buyunguero, there are 3,000 refugees who have arrived in one month. In the area, there are at least 30,000 living in conditions like this. This is once again the result of violence when no one is spared, not even small children. The Italian missionaries running the camp have detailed lists of killed. Their family names are not shown in fear of reprisal. Sette anni, cinque anni, due anni. Was here. The bullet holes are still there. Three years ago, in September 1995, three missionaries were killed in cold blood by Burundian army soldiers. And then they shot him just above the ear. Aldo was lying here, his head pointing there. Aldo era qua, con la testa girata in là. The night is falling. Most refugees are forced to sleep rough, but inside the chapel, a few have found shelter for the night. The people here have fled from just those whose duty it was to protect them. Here, the response from the Burundian army towards the guerrillas has instead been directed towards the population. They entered in all the houses in the Kaleen. They came every day, every day to kill. The people ran away from the soldiers. And when some people turned their head back to see, they saw only bodies. Few of the refugees dare to give interviews in front of the camera, in fear for their lives. But it becomes clear that the killings of the people in the area have been systematic. I saw the Burundian soldiers going on hunting people, whilst the rebels outside were no longer there. The men who died were only Hutus, and no Tutsis died. The soldiers killed men, women and children first of all, so as to eradicate the Hutu ethnic group. The advice I give to overcome this crisis is that the soldiers, when they see a civilian, they should not kill him or her, but they should arrest him and put him under investigation until they find the truth. Then they should negotiate with the rebels and come to a compromise. Burundi is in a state of low-intensity civil war between the army and guerrilla groups, and no one can ever defeat the other in the difficult terrain. Both sides are badly equipped. Those are weapons the army claims to have seized from the guerrillas. The Burundian army counts less than 50,000 troops in spite of large recruitments. The standard is far from any modern army. Discipline is negligible. The results are abuse of the population. No army in the world is perfect. We know that there are some people in our army who, are not pe who committed some uh, acts of violence. They are punished severely and we are very adamant on that. But few, if any, high-ranking officers have been convicted for abuse because the army is part of the conflict between the Hutu and Tutsis that holds Burundi in a steady grip. According to uncertain numbers, 200,000 lives have been lost in the last five years. Who is not genocidal in Burundi? Who? So I think that uh, the genocidal problem, which is a reality in Burundi, is being manipulating by politicians. What we need is to understand why genocide is a fact in the history of Burundi. In Burundi and Rwanda, the principle of divide and rule has been practiced in every sense possible. The division of people into Hutu or Tutsi is social and lacks any ethnical relevance. 
There is no cultural difference whatsoever, but nevertheless, during history, it has become a reality. The Belgian colonial period enhanced the differences between the majority Hutu and the minority Tutsi. And when Burundi gained independence in 62, the prerequisites for democracy didn't exist. A Tutsi-dominated military dictatorship followed, and tension between Hutu and Tutsi increased. But at the end of the 80s, a process of democratization began, and in the ethnically divided elections that followed in 1993, the Tutsi-dominated Upronu party lost heavily to the Hutu-based Frodebu party whose leader Melchior and Dade became president. Only a few months later, and Dade was brutally murdered in a military coup d'etat. Immediately, massacres erupted, where over 100,000 were assassinated by extremists from both sides. The genocide in the neighboring country of Rwanda in 1994, where close to one million were massacred by Hutu extremists, further increased tensions in Burundi. Today, the feeling of ethnic belonging in Burundi and Rwanda has become a matter of survival, basically, or is perceived anyway as a matter of survival. And in that sense, those groups, although they're not, technically speaking, ethnic groups, have now become politically much more important than real ethnic groups elsewhere in Africa. In 1994, after a new government was negotiated under UN supervision, Sylvester Unterbantengagne from Frodebu became president. But the government's work was sabotaged, violence increased, and the president was heavily criticized by Tutsi groups. Large ethnically based demonstrations were organized demanding Ntumbanya's resignation. Finally, in July 1996, there was a military coup d'etat where Major Pierre Boyoya from Uprona was installed as president the same president that directed the democratization process leading up to the elections in 93. The military takeover was heavily criticized internationally, recognized by few countries. The legitimacy of my government is coming from the achievement of this government. When the coup took place last year in July 96, the, the, the country was on the verge of genocide, of disintegration. Now it's again security in Burundi. Now it's again question of peace process. I think legitimacy is gaining in this way. The ousted president took refuge at the American embassy, but for the last six months been living in a government-paid villa in the capital Bujumbara. Ex-president Ntubantanganyi, whose wife and child were murdered in the coup against Ndadi, sees a strong connection between the two coups in 93 and 96. Because uh, when you see the force, or political forces, or military forces, and the social forces which were implicated in the coup d'etat against Ndadi, and the coup d'etat against me, they are the same. The parallels with Europe are obvious. In Europe, the wealth of the few was created during centuries of power struggle between oligarchies, often disguised as religious or ethnic conflicts. Not until the development of the democratic state could the power of the oligarchies be broken. Philip Rentens, professor in African history at the University of Antwerp, recognizes Africa is going through such a process today. In Africa, including in Burundi, control of the state is much more important than it is in Europe. I mean, it is through the state that you access everything. All the privileges, uh, wealth, not just political power, but wealth, access to credit, access to scholarships for your children, um, impunity, you can basically do whatever you like. The state is the main instrument of accumulation and re reproduction of a social class. And in the case of Burundi, it is a very small social class indeed. 
In general, the two major political parties, Aprona and Frodebu, attract Tutsis and Hutus respectively. But since Frodebu didn't gain legitimacy until 1991, an ethnic imbalance in the society was created. In all the 30 years of one-party system, there was a great ethnic exclusivity in the schools, commerce and army, so that today all sectors of justice, army, commerce, education and public systems are dominated by only one ethnic group, the minority one. The great majorities are excluded from these sectors. For the Fredebu party, which with an overwhelming majority won the ethnically divided election in 1993, it is a frustrating situation to be denied legitimate power. In spite of the indisputable victory, Fredebu has a great disadvantage. All the forces of the police and the authorities, the army, the gendarmerie, the judicial system, are still in an unofficial way controlled by the other party. The army has always been a factor of power in Burundi, characterized by several coups. According to the UN Commission of Inquiry, the planning and the execution of the coup against President Ndadi was carried out by officers highly placed in the line of command of the Burundian army. And the army still consider themselves to carry a special responsibility for the country. We are not there to rule. We are there to work with the administration, to work with the population, not to, to rule. But if there are some rulers who are there, who are forbidding us to protect the population. Obviously, we are not going to sit down, lay our arms, and let them abuse the population. No way. We fight them if needs are there. What we have is to, to reform the army to be a national, a republican army, not an army who is, uh, who is there to serve the interest of uh, a minority, not, a min not an ethnic minority, a group, but a group, a minority of some, uh, some men. Real power in Burundi is tightly held within a small group, acting behind the curtains of the existing official structures. A number of central players are actually civilians, and sometimes one wonders to what extent initiatives like a coup d'etat, for instance, very much destabilizing initiatives, are taken by the military. They may well be taken by civilians, actually, but they're exercised on the ground, of course, by military. But it's certainly a very, very small group. I would, I would think a, a couple of dozen people rather than, than thousands. Immediately after the coup in July 1996, sanctions were imposed on Burundi. This has mostly affected civil life, especially health care, which was of extremely low standard even before, due to the general level of poverty in the country. The sanctions are total. Not even the most essential drugs can be imported. And the operation theatres here at the main hospital are hardly working due to a lack of spare parts for the technical equipment. The medicines for the operation and everything which is expensive and technically advanced, if we don't have it, we just lose the lives of people. People die. Some patients have been badly hit by mines occasionally put down in the roads by Hutu guerrillas. And the sanctions are viewed by the present government as a support to these groups. The sanctions were imposed by nearby regional states, the decision mostly backed by Tanzania, whose former president, Nyerere, acts as mediator in the Burundian conflict. Nyerere is now seen as partisan by the regime in Burundi. Uh, some uh, prominent personality of the neighboring country uh, has been involved 
in trying to help Burundians to come out of the crisis. And my point of view is that the sanction is the expression of the frustration where the, the change came and uh, was not exactly what they, they expected. It's only that. But here, on the main road from Tanzania, heavily loaded fuel tankers can be seen, and paradoxically from the country most supporting the embargo. What is said and what is done in Africa are two different things, and the Tanzanian number plates are clearly visible. The officially illegal fuel import is saturating the market. The price is under European level, and in the streets of the capital, Bujumbura, traffic is intense. As is the boat traffic on the clear and deep Tanganyika Lake into the port of Bujumbura. Because sanctions mean money, big money for those who control the tiny state of Burundi. One example out of many. In February last year, a contract was signed by the state coffee company. Nine and a half thousand tons of coffee beans, about one third of the annual production, were sold for 98 cents per pound. But the world market value was at least double that. According to international coffee dealers, close to 10 million US dollars disappeared from the Burundian revenue. A plan for actions against economic criminality was launched by the government though the aim doesn't seem to be to convict everyone guilty of suspicious business. Yes, black in the black market, yes. And they have a lot of money now. So, you see, the real power is for them. And the government must respect them. Because if the government doesn't respect them, they will say, you can do what you want, because they know that the government is not able to do anything now. Burundi is a tiny, overpopulated Central African country just south of the equator. 95% of the 6 million inhabitants are living in simple clay houses in the countryside. Most agriculture is for the household. The country is one of the poorest and least developed in the world. It's the lead drummer who sets new rhythm patterns, each with its own strength and message, just like the different dances. In spite of the war, there is still a strong local culture maintained. And here in the village of Nimugari, in the eastern part of the country, the traditions are used in trying to bring about peace and reconciliation. <laughs> Yes, the drumming makes us come together, all ethnic groups, and together we create peace. Here and now we can change views without fear. Not much effort was made during the colonial time to develop the country, and the majority of the population are illiterate. But they have a will to build a future together, and by meeting and having courses, problems are solved. By discussions, possibilities to developments on their own are exchanged. Shall we shall
But Burundi is lacking economic means for development. The whole state's budget equals the budget of a mid-sized European town. One third of Burundi's GNP is foreign aid, an aid only covering humanitarian needs, and the needs are huge. More than half a million displaced people are living in camps under unbearable conditions, many of them severely malnutritioned, according to the WFP. Most have been living here since massacres in 1993 and do not dare to return home. The extremists are still controlling their home colonies. It is impossible for us to return home because they are still prepared to kill us. They have said that if we come back, this time, they will spare no one. They will attack us in the night, surround our houses, and then chop us dead. Just because they want to kill every one of us, so that only their group will be left in the colony. Confidence building and dialogue are words in common use by the international community when speaking about Burundi. But for every part in the conflict, the other part is considered genocidal, thereby ruling out negotiations. But the Boyoyo Putsch government did go into secret negotiations with the CNDD guerrilla in Rome at the beginning of last year. The negotiations were heavily criticised when disclosed, especially by Oprona, the president's own party, who accused him of high treason. We have even said that. We treated the initiative as an act of treachery not only towards Uprona, but also as an act of treachery towards the nation, because there has been lies and a consecration of immorality. Now, is Uprona going to negotiate with genocidal organizations? I think that in a genocidal conflict, the peaceful resolution of conflicts in case of genocide is not negotiations, it's the application of justice in its integrity. The search for a negotiated settlement of the conflict by President Bioya has made the leadership of Aprona break ties with him. He has shown that he has no confidence in Uprona by not seeking its support other than constraining Uprona to adhere. So I think that this confidence doesn't exist anymore in one way or the other. New negotiations were to take place in Tanzania in August of last year, but the day before Bioya was forced to cancel. Since then, formal talks are grounded. The forces in Burundi opposing negotiations are too powerful, and the tense relations to Tanzania and the mediator Nyeri was given as an excuse for the cancellation. We say we are ready to, to resume talks, but we have some concerns. We don't, we want to negotiate in a neutral venue. We want a neutral team of mediators. We don't accept some condition uh, put forward by the regional leaders uh, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, I say that uh, it seems that Mr. Boyoya is afraid of the oligarchy, but uh, I say you that uh, a political man has not to be afraid. If you are afraid in politics, you are not able to do anything. The main political actor, I think, in Burundi is fear. Fear and distrust make the, com make the confidence needed to strike a compromise, to engage in negotiations, then to loyally uh, implement them, make it, of course, extremely more difficult than if that fear and distrust were not present. The fear of genocide affects everyone, and therefore the so-called ethnic belonging is seen as protection. And by maintaining this fear, the present groups can control the society. 
The will to political cooperation and compromises, which are needed in a democracy, are lacking almost totally. And it will take a long process before the Burundian society is ready for democratic elections. Now, it's not time to go in elections in Burundi. No, we have, bef we have before to negotiate some kind of reforms to introduce in our state, in the organization of our state. I don't want a state against people. We can't organize democratic election in a state which is against the people. We established a transitional period of three years. And uh, in those three years, we are going to organize a peace process. And we are going to discuss a new constitu constitution, how democracy is going to be uh, reestablished. And this will come from the political dialogue, which is now engaged. Many international actors are trying to contribute to the peace processes in Burundi by their own agenda. Aid, sanctions, commerce, loans and other means are used in a contradictory way, causing an unmanageable pressure upon the small country. It is huge interest and this very diversified and uncoordinated interest has become eventually, I believe, part of the problem rather than part of the solution of the problems of Burundi. Today, in Burundi, the international community is not really helping, but is only pressing. Then I think uh, to build the peace in Burundi, to miss, build democracy, we have to know that and we have learned that it's our duty, we Burundians or we Africans. It is difficult for Burundi to control its own development. The governmental power is weak, its stability under constant threat. Though the Bioya regime has good connections with the Democratic Republic of Congo, whose President Kabila openly defied the sanctions by visiting Burundi in November last year. Together with the neighbouring country Rwanda, they have common security problems with the guerrillas. Since the fall of Zaire, the instability in the region has increased. Of course, security in Burundi is influenced by security in the region. Uh, our main concern is what is happening in the east of or the Republic of Democratic of Congo. It's our great concern. The Hutu rebels moving freely in the densely forested border area are stepping up their insurgency. The deliveries of weapons to the region are great, and according to a recent report by Human Rights Watch, countries as far apart as China, France, North Korea and Russia are supplying arms to all sides. And the mineral wealth, among them diamonds, provides the economical means necessary to finance the war for those who control the region. What is called the Great Lakes region, the most densely populated part of Africa, is in a state of semi-civil war, all of it. And I think if no political solutions are found, and I've got to say I'm rather pessimistic about them being found, uh, is probably facing instability, violent destabilization, for a period that might be actually quite long, 10, 15 years. And, 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 and that means that uh, 20 million people are at risk today. <laughs>